Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our monthly webinar series uh, entitled Environmental Essentials for In-House Counsel. Uh, this month in December, we're covering bankruptcy and environmental law, talking a little bit about how bankruptcy law works in the context of the various environmental liabilities that we encounter, and then talking a little bit about a couple of recent cases, uh, both in the uh, Delaware bankruptcy courts, as well as the Texas bankruptcy courts. I'm Jason Hutt. I'm the partner in the Environment, Lands, and Resources Department at Bracewell. I'm joined today by my partner, Mark Dendinger, from the bankruptcy uh, group. He and I, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with him on a number of these cases, and so I hope uh, you'll enjoy hearing his insights. I'm going to uh, ask Mark to do his level best not to talk too much in the bankruptcy jargon uh, for those environmental professionals who are participating in this series. Uh, but let's start today, Mark, with just talking about kind of bankruptcy from a 101 perspective and a little bit about how uh, liabilities work in the context of a bankruptcy. So then we can think about how the different environmental liabilities wash through that process. Great. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Pleased to be here presenting to this group. So bankruptcy law and environmental law are at odds with one another in many respects. But to best understand that, one really needs to understand some general baseline with regard to what bankruptcy is and some bankruptcy 101 in that regard. So when any company in the United States or an international company for that matter that files for bankruptcy in the United States, files for bankruptcy, the concept of a bankruptcy estate is created. So you can draw a circle around that debtor that has just pushed the button to file for bankruptcy. And all of the debtor's property becomes part of property of the debtor's bankruptcy estate. And you probably read about in the papers the concept of an automatic stay that is created at that same moment in time where the debtor enjoys what's called a breathing spell. And it prevents creditors from taking action against the debtor and against the debtor's property, again, that is property of that debtor's bankruptcy estate. The other significant thing to understand with regard to the filing of the petition for bankruptcy is it takes the debtor's balance sheet and splits it in two. It bifurcates it between two types of liabilities at that moment in time, pre-petition liabilities and post-petition liabilities. And that's an important concept to keep in your mind as we run through the presentation as well as the key cases that Jason had said we we're gonna highlight for you all. So once the debtor's in bankruptcy, it generally operates its business in the ordinary course. It does have to go to court to ask permission from the court to do certain things over the course of the case. But generally the, the idea is the debtor hopes at the end of the case to propose a chapter 11 plan. And it can be a plan of reorganization or one of liquidation Generally, debtors aim to file plans of reorganization and hope to successfully emerge from bankruptcy based on the parameters of what's contained in that plan. Coming back to the pre- and post-petition liabilities, the idea behind the plan is the debtor can do certain things with its pre-petition liabilities that it cannot do with its post-petition liabilities. So with regard to any pre-petition liabilities, the plan can extinguish those liabilities if they're coit on the petition date, i.e. fixed to a sum certain, easily identified and liquidated into a claim. With regard to any post-petition liabilities that benefit the debtor and benefit the debtor's bankruptcy estate for the period of time the debtor operated in Chapter 11, the debtor cannot extinguish those liabilities in the same manner. Rather, the debtor must pay those liabilities in 100% 100, uh, 100 in full in cash upon the debtor's emergence from bankruptcy. So again, the pre and post petition liability distinction is quite important because one could surmise a debtor who discharges pre petition liabilities at cents on the dollar, but must satisfy post petition liabilities and give those liabilities a 100% recovery in the bankruptcy in cash. Now, one other thing to highlight with regard to Bankruptcy Law 101 that is important for today's presentation, the debtor has various powers in the bankruptcy, and one power the debtor has is an abandonment power. The debtor can look at some of that property that's property of its bankruptcy estate, and it can elect to simply abandon the property to the public. 
They can't pick someone that's a creditor or pick a prior possessory interest owner and say, I'm abandoning it to you. They simply can say, I, the debtor, am no longer uh, needing this property to reorganize around, and I, I wish to abandon it. And there are some standards to be applied. The bankruptcy code applies a burdensome or inconsequential value standard. So the debtor can go to court and say, this property is either burdensome or it's no longer valuable to me. And that's sufficient from a bankruptcy law perspective. However, environmental law comes into play in that circumstance. And a United States Supreme Court called Midlantic applied additional standards to the debtor that the debtor must meet in order to abandon either burdensome or valueless property. The first is that the abandonment cannot violate any applicable state law that's reasonably designed to protect the public health or safety from identified hazards. The second standard that Atlantic applies is, however, if there is a potential state law violation of that which I just described, the violation could occur so long as the violation does not cause an imminent or identifiable harm. So those are important environmental components to the abandonment power of a debtor, and you'll see those elements uh, made manifest in our case discussion today. A couple other comments on environmental issues in bankruptcy. Again, coming back to the pre and post petition bifurcation of the debtor's balance sheet. So, sticking now just with pre petition obligations, some of those obligations that are environmental obligations are subject to discharge and others are not. Generally speaking, as I had said in my opening remarks, the concept of a monetary obligation comes into play. If the environmental obligation is a co obligation that uh, can be reduced to a sum certain in some fashion that could be then addressed through the debtor's bankruptcy plan, that's the type of obligation that, generally speaking, could be discharged through the bankruptcy process. There are a couple of standards that the leading cases apply to try and frame the thinking on whether or not these types of obligations could be reduced to fixed claims. In the context of cleanup obligations, the two prevailing standards and tests are whether it is a fair meets the fair contemplation test or meets the pre-petition relationship theory test. That essentially, in either case, the, the debtor and the creditor need to have fairly contemplated that this is the type of obligation that could be reduced to a sum certain and fixed such that the debtor, when filing for bankruptcy and trying to discharge those obligations, given the pre-petition relationship and the fixing of that claim, that the debtor is capable of discharging them through the plan. Now, with every rule, there's an exception. In the context of pre-petition obligations, there are types of key environmental obligations that are not subject to discharge. Some of those are listed in the materials for you all today. Uh, they include site conditions, cap and trade surrender obligations, which we'll come to in a moment, Midlantic situations like that, which we just described for you, channeling injunctions and other types of obligations are not subject to discharge through bankruptcy. I thought, Mark, you, you really highlighted this at the beginning, which is that the two areas of law are in tension with one another. You think you said at odds. Uh, and certainly the Midlantic sort of case law and its progeny evolved in the context of site contamination issues, right? Where, well, if you have a tank that's actively leaking something, you know, into the ground or onto a neighboring property, you might have that imminent and substantial harm circumstance. But after that, those cases were sort of resolved and how you dealt with circle type liabilities, there have been these more complicated cases of uh, cap and trade systems and decommissioning. But ultimately, environmental law was designed to sort of take a liability and allow people to push that liability out in time so long as they manage the liability in a way that wasn't causing a harm to the to the public or to natural resources. And bankruptcy law, as you noted, is sort of is, is dealing with coit liabilities and then dealing with who's in the pecking order of the of the creditors to determine which of those creditors get paid out. And that's what that's what creates that tension and why it's it's become a very interesting area of law. Uh, I think to try to understand and navigate because of those how those long term liabilities are generally dealt with in the environmental context. So this was just a slide to kind of summarize th that tension 
and why uh, you know thinking your way through the consequences of environmental liabilities in the rubric of a bankruptcy process uh, is challenging. Thanks, Jason. Let's jump into the decisions. We have three to highlight for you today. The first is La Paloma. The second is Philadelphia Energy Solutions. And the third is Fieldwood Energy, which is the most recent of the three decisions and just concluded in Texas a few months ago. So starting with La Paloma, this is a somewhat dated decision at this point, but still a very relevant decision for purposes of highlighting the intersection of environmental and bankruptcy law. So La Paloma Generating Company was a power plant owning debtor. It owned a, and operated a natural gas fired combined cycle facility in California, and it filed for bankruptcy in uh, December of 2016 in Delaware. At the time, the, the power plant owning debtor filed for bankruptcy, it was suffering a liquidity crisis. And it had gone to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to try and obtain a reliability must run designation from FERC to forestall some of the liquidity issues the, the company was experiencing. And um, when FERC elected not to give that designation to the power plant owning debtor, that coupled with some regulatory burden under the California cap and trade program in place at the time really ended up pushing the company to file for chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in Delaware. The key environmental issue in the case related to the cap and trade program put in place by CARB. So under the program, essentially companies were required to purchase and turn air emission credits into the state of California for every ton of CO2 emitted by the power plant. And this was becoming unwieldy for the company to meet this obligation and it had contributed to the bankruptcy filing. And, and so as part of the bankruptcy case, the company decided the best strategy was to sell the plant through the bankruptcy process. And they marketed the asset for sale and as with many of these cases, the most natural buyer in the bankruptcy ended up being the first lien lenders to the company, in this case, a single lender, l &V. And of course, what took center stage were the company's emissions obligations and whether or not the buyer of the plant ought to be tagged with the emissions obligations of legacy La Paloma, or in the alternative, whether they could purchase the power plant free and clear of those obligations under a bankruptcy sale process. You may in your practice hear about free and clear sales through bankruptcy. It's again, like abandonment. Uh, it's a power of the debtor to sell assets free and clear of all liens, claims, encumbrances, and interests and to, to a buyer and gives the buyer a fresh start to own the asset free of all those obligations. And the buyer, since the proceeds into the debtor and the proceeds become property of the bankruptcy estate and the lender's liens attached to the sale proceeds. That's generally how the bankruptcy process works and addresses sales. In this case, the specific issue in the case was whether or not these emissions obligations were tantamount to interests such that they fit within the definition of the bankruptcy code, free and clear of liens, claims, encumbrances, and interests such that the buyer, the first lien lender, could own the plant free and clear of La Paloma's legacy emissions obligations. So we've put together a chart here, and we won't go through it in detail, uh, but you can, you can see the various arguments that, that uh, California Air Resources Board were putting forward in the case as to why the integrity of the cap and trade program relied upon the emissions obligations traveling to any owner of the plant applying a successor liability theory, and L&V, the lender, saying quite the opposite, which is these meet the definition, these emissions obligations meet the definition of interests under the Bankruptcy Code, Section 363 specifically. There is not successor liability under the, under the regulatory uh, framework, and so I ought to, as the new lender and buyer of these assets, be able to own them free and clear. Ultimately, the bankruptcy court agreed with the lender and said, in particular, because there was no successor liability clause in the cap and trade program, that 
La Paloma, the debtor, was able to sell the plant free and clear to the lender. Unsurprisingly, uh, CARB appealed the ruling, but they sought but were not, unable to obtain a stay pending appeal of that ruling. And in bankruptcy, that's essentially the death knell to be able to pursue an appeal, a substantive appeal of the issue in the context of an asset sale. There's a section of the bankruptcy code that essentially says that any subsequent appeal absent obtaining a state pending appeal is essentially equitably moot. And so at that point in time, LNV filed a motion to dismiss the appeal on that basis, and the Delaware District Court on appeal granted the motion, and that concluded the issue in that decision. So there are just two really interesting things from that from an environmental lawyer's perspective. One is you use the term legacy emission obligation. And I think part of the dis, what was at, in dispute there was that the obligation to surrender the emission credit arose post-petition, but the emission that gave rise to that surrender obligation occurred pre-petition. And so one of the questions was, well, when does the obligation actually arise? Is it a pre-petition obligation or a post-petition obligation? Because as you noted at the beginning of the presentation under the, in Bankruptcy 101, if you have a post-petition obligation that's necessary to comply with law, those are $0.01 cent dollars that could be spent by the estate uh, to meet the obligation. And here, part of the dispute was over that. And the second is, you know, CARB had a pretty compelling argument that its cap and trade program, the cap component of it, could be entirely eroded through these bankruptcy processes if the court were to rule in, in LNB's favor, which it did, in that the emissions associated with those uh, with the these, this power plant that occurred during that time period were supposed to be under that cap, and everyone in the regime was trading on the basis of the existence of those emissions and the finite availability of credits in that regime, and that was eroded by uh, by that decision. And I know the California legislature's gone back and, and re-looked at that and made some some clarifications, but those were issues for sort of uh, uniquely undertaken in the La Paloma decision that will have repercussions for, for bankruptcies in the future about how these cap and trade regimes uh, wash through the, through the bankruptcy process. Great. So turning to the second decision that we'd like to highlight for you all today, uh, PES Holdings or Philadelphia Energy Solutions, more commonly referred to in the market. But this is a, a, a company that owned one of the largest oil refining complexes on the East Coast. And ultimately, again, due to liquidity constraints, et cetera, the family comp befalling the company, they filed for bankruptcy again in Delaware in January of 2018. The issue in this case, and one of the contributing factors to PES filing for bankruptcy was the EPA's renewable fuel standards, which required refiners such as Philadelphia Energy Solutions to either blend biofuels into their products or in the alternative, buy credits from those who did blend biofuels into their products in order to comply with the renewable fuel standards in place by the EPA. And so the key environmental issue was whether or not the company could comply with that. And if they couldn't, once the company had filed for bankruptcy, how uh, were the RFS um, obligations treated in the bankruptcy? So. In this case, Philadelphia Energy filed a plan on the first day, which is somewhat unusual. Usually in bankruptcy, if you haven't negotiated with your creditors before you file the cases, you would have a period of at least 120 days to formulate that Chapter 11 plan that we spoke of in the La Paloma case. In this case, um, PES filed the plan on day one and immediately drew an objection from the EPA because with regard to PES's compliance obligations, the plan essentially said that with regard to legacy obligations from 2016, PES would only be obligated to comply for a portion of the RFS obligations. Uh, they would not have to comply with the entirety of the 2017 RFS obligations. And for the period of the year, in which the bankruptcy was commenced in 2018, again, PES would only have to comply with a portion of those obligations. Now, ultimately, uh, after some time in the bankruptcy, EPA thought the path of least resistance, I suppose, was to, to settle the issue 
with PES, with the debtor. And so in, in conjunction with the plan process, which involves approving a disclosure statement in the bankruptcy, and then ultimately confirming a plan in the bankruptcy, all the while that was going on, EPA was negotiating a settlement agreement with PES to settle out this issue. So we don't have a, a decision here where the issue was litigated and, and we don't have a bankruptcy court weighing in on whether or not these would be pre-petition or post-petition obligations subject to discharge. But um, the settlement agreement essentially said that the that um, PES would be able to surrender its existing credits for 2016 and 17 and would permit PES to avoid having to purchase additional credits going forward as a condition of it coming out of the bankruptcy. The, the settlement agreement was put forward at the same hearing as the planned confirmation hearing was conducted. And you could see from the slides, they were, they were essentially adjudicated at the same time in early April. Now, um, the, and, and there's some comments here about what it meant by way of relieving PES of a liquidity burden with regard to compliance with the RFS credits here. They estimated that it knocked down about 75% of the, of the uh, credits and the compliance obligations in place in PES and saved the company about $200 million. Now, uh, it wasn't enough to keep the company from filing for bankruptcy a second time, uh, Chapter 22 as we call it in the bankruptcy world. But um, that was for a, a wholly different reason. In 2019, the company ended up filing for bankruptcy because there was a there was a fire that destroyed significant components of the refinery complex. And so unfortunately, the company uh, met hard times ultimately, and the settlement couldn't save them for, uh, for reasons outside of their control. But again, the, the point here is this is another type of environmental uh, instrument that can be addressed in the bankruptcy case. And if it were not addressed to be a settlement, it would be an item that the bankruptcy court would have weighed in upon for purposes of permitting this debtor to exit bankruptcy. And where EPA was willing to cut a deal that forfeited $200 million of value to the renewable fuels marketplace in order to, to get it done. So really interesting decision and settlement by the agency. Okay, and now that the last decision we have to highlight for you today, and again, this is the most recent decision, and this is one Jason and I uh, synced up on um, in a pretty significant manner uh, for, for most of 2021. So, Fieldwood Energy, again, this was a Chapter 22. Fieldwood had previously filed for bankruptcy, and it was a very short case, and it was almost a, a pre-pack. It may actually have been a pre-pack. So a, a pre-pack is that process I described previously where you negotiate the parameters of a bankruptcy plan before you file for bankruptcy, and you do all the steps that you would do to solicit votes on that plan um, before the bankruptcy is filed in certain instances, or you don't you don't solicit those votes. You do everything but that. You file the plan, then solicit the votes. And the idea is it limits the duration of your stay in bankruptcy. So you can do what you do best, which is continue to operate your business as a going concern free of influence from the court. These cases can be 24-hour cases if you solicit votes correctly. Uh, they can be a little bit longer. In this case, this, the prior bankruptcy was a 45-day bankruptcy and a true reorg. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to uh, keep the company uh, out of uh, experiencing hard times, and the company filed a, a second bankruptcy in the Southern District of Texas in August of 2020. And for the first three or four months of the bankruptcy, I would describe the debtor as just trying to get the lay of the land. It was a, it was a mammoth filing. Lots of debtors were involved, a lot of creditors involved, first lien lenders, um, a creditors committee, a bunch of oil majors who had predecessor liability, a number of surety bond providers who had written surety bonds and adequate assurance uh, to the debtor under various contracts uh, and, and with regard to various decommissioning liabilities that the debtor uh, had on its balance sheet that the debtor ultimately sought to address in the bankruptcy. So a, a huge case, a tremendous number of debtors and uh, in addition to all those folks, the United States federal government and its agencies were involved in a major way in the case. So 
it took the debtor a while to get going and get organized, in my opinion, and just figure out where their friends were and the enemies were so they could figure out how to address them and ultimately get a, a Chapter 11 plan proposed. And so four, four or five months after the bankruptcy was commenced, the debtor fired a shirt, first shot across the bow and filed a plan on New Year's Day. And the plan, among other aspects of the plan, the debtor sought to address an estimated $1.3 billion in decommissioning liabilities for Gulf of Mexico oil and gas assets the debtor at the time owned through a divisive merger. This was a, a bankruptcy first for me. The idea was through the bankruptcy itself, the debtor was going to split itself into various buckets and put assets into the various buckets, depending upon what the debtor's strategy was for addressing those assets in the bankruptcy. So um, in the first case, the first lien lenders here came in and said, we will, buy the, we will buy a certain subset of the deep water assets and shelf assets for cash and, uh, and potentially us credit bidding, which is a concept where a, a secured lender can set off as purchase price a component of uh, pre-petition funded secured indebtedness as a component of a purchase price for an asset. But the, the debtor said, I'm going to tee up a sale of certain of the valuable assets to my lenders. And if someone comes in with a higher and better offer, so be it. We'll run an auction. We'll run a fair and open process. But I've got the first lien lenders interested in buying a subset of the assets. Then with respect to certain other assets that weren't uh, valuable or the lenders were not interested in purchasing, the debtor divided those assets into various buckets and came up with names for new entities that were being formed in the bankruptcy to receive those assets. The first was FWE1, Fieldwood Energy 1. And Fieldwood Energy 1 was going to receive certain legacy assets that were still producing assets. And so they were still economic assets in the mind of those uh, that would, would take ownership of those assets through the bankruptcy. But again, they didn't fit within the category of assets the first lien lenders were interested in purchasing. The next bucket of assets were non-producing assets, and um, and so they were no longer economic assets for the owner, Fieldwood, and Fieldwood needed to do something with them in the bankruptcy. So they elected to put them into a, an entity called FWE3, Fieldwood Energy 3. Again, these were non-producing assets, and the distinction here was that um, these were examples where there was no predecessor and in interest that Fieldwood could readily identify to whom the ultimate plugging and abandonment and decommissioning liabilities would uh, would return to as a potential viable party to to uh, to cover those types of liabilities. These were examples of non-producing assets where the debtor could not identify, nor could the federal government easily identify a predecessor with predecessor liability. And the last set of um, assets. And again, harkening back to the very beginning in the Bankruptcy 101, one of the powers of the debtor is just to abandon certain assets. And so the debtor elected to abandon certain assets in the bankruptcy that were non-producing offshore assets where they were able to locate uh, predecessor owners in the chain of title that all could ultimately ought to, in the debtor's mind, be able to step up for a component, a significant component of the liability the debtor could not address itself and a component of the $1.3 billion that the debtor was ultimately trying to um, address through the bankruptcy process. So essentially the key environmental issue in the case was was the government going to come was the government going to come on side to all of this? Because the government had a hand and a consent right to the entirety of the transactions just described, tantamount to a consent right. In order for the leases, the offshore leases, to transfer through that asset sale to the first lien lenders, all the parties knew the government would have to permit, uh, would have to consent to the transfers of those leases, and the government would have to get comfortable that uh, that the transfer of those leases would also come with sufficient financial assurance set aside by the new owner operator of those assets and of those leases, such that uh, we wouldn't have a Fieldwood Chapter. Uh, 33, essentially, or we wouldn't have a, a bankruptcy filing of the new owner operator of those leases through that, through that transfer. 
But the other way in which the federal government came into play was with everything else that was described, the, the, the divisive merger of certain producing assets into one bucket, leaving behind other non-producing assets in a, a second bucket field with three where they couldn't identify a predecessor, and then abandoning certain other assets through the bankruptcy under the inconsequential value or burdensome to the estate standard that we described on the theory there would not be a mid-Atlantic violation through the abandonment, and on the theory that there was a, an oil major or someone who, in the debtor's mind and hopefully the government's mind, could, um, could assume the liabilities associated with those abandoned assets and leases and address them and take them essentially on their own balance sheet after the conclusion of the bankruptcy. So out of the gate, you can imagine the debtor was met uh, the debtor was met with tremendous opposition on all fronts, and the government was essentially just trying to play peacekeeper in a way as between all of the various parties that, that were described. The reason being is the government, among other things, had an objective to ensure that the predecessors would be able to fund the plugging and abandonment obligations, but also uh, they were concerned that um, they were concerned for the public and a financial burden on the public, and they were also concerned about there being an undue environmental harm that could be created if the debtor's plan ultimately uh, did not go forward and the debtor had to come up with another plan to address all the various assets as opposed to that, that which the debtor had designed through its plan. Ultimately, through a series of discussions that lasted months, multiple predecessors and interest eventually reached settlements with Fieldwood and the lenders that resulted in um, small amounts of contribution from Fieldwood and the lenders to help fund some of the decommissioning obligations that were being put into, uh, uh, into the abandonment bucket and or into the Fieldwood Energy 3 bucket. And that ultimately helped Fieldwood resolve approximately 91% of the debtor's decommissioning obligations. And once the settlements were struck and the government got comfortable that there would be someone there essentially uh, to come in and, and be the safety net to the, to the debtors uh, being incapable to satisfy the decommissioning obligations on its own balance sheet, the government ultimately approved the plan. The parties that resisted the plan most vehemently in all of it, in my opinion, were the debtor's surety bond providers, because ultimately, it, through the bankruptcy plan confirmation process and through entry of the confirmation order, the bankruptcy judge looked the surety bond providers in the eye and said, you know, you, you wrote these surety bond obligations to Fieldwood in the first instance, and, and the government was reliant upon you being the financial assurance in place uh, to, to essentially address a situation like that which Fieldwood is, is currently experiencing, which is they cannot satisfy the obligations themselves. That's the exact time when surety bond credit ought to be able to be drawn upon to prevent others uh, from having to suffer um, beyond the, the surety bonds, essentially coming in and and, uh, and helping the debtor forestall some of the obligations that otherwise was incapable of addressing. And so the surety bonds never really truly got comfortable uh, with the bankruptcy plan. They ultimately fought uh, the confirmation process of that plan. The, the plan was ultimately confirmed over vehement opposition from the surety bond providers. The surety bond providers appealed the confirmation decision from the bankruptcy judge, yet many of those surety bond providers eventually either withdrew opposition to the plan or, um, or conducted a limited amount of appeal, appeal of, the, of the confirmation of the plan and, and ultimately uh, did not get a favorable ruling out of the appellate court. So Again, in sum, the key issue here is the treatment of plugging and abandonment obligations in the bankruptcy and how, with the federal government's support, a debtor could use the bankruptcy process to move valuable assets into one bucket, uh, non-valuable assets into another bucket, and discharge and, uh, and move to the balance sheet of others in the bankruptcy process, decommissioning obligations, the debtor can no longer satisfy itself. I think too, Mark, you flagged at the beginning that getting the government on side was really important for the debtors. And it wasn't, it, so we heard the Midlantic arguments 
raised, but I think the most powerful thing in the government's arsenal proved to be that because all of these assets were on federal lands, the government had the ability to prove the transfer of those assets. So in the divisive merger to place those deep water and shelf assets that the lenders wanted placed in a, in its separate bucket, the government would have to approve that transfer. And so in order to get them to remove their objection to the rest of the treatment of the other assets, uh, some concessions had to be made for how those were being being dealt with. And as you noted, you know, 91% of the decommissioning obligations were ultimately sort of resolved through the divisive merger process. So while the Mid-Atlantic arguments were there and lurking, I think those ultimately would probably have been difficult to demonstrate in these circumstances, particularly because of, of the Venico bankruptcy, uh, which I know we worked on together and didn't have time to cover today. But um, so it's another piece of the puzzle is if when you're talking about uh, bankruptcies involving companies or debtors that have assets on federal lands, the role of the government in approving the transfer of those assets to to other parties uh, can be important. So uh, we're a little bit past time. Uh, we covered a lot of stuff uh, that's been happening over the last several years. I'll ask you one very important question, Mark, as, as a professor of bankruptcy law uh, up there at, at UConn. Uh, every environmental uh, professional should know why there are no even numbered uh, bankruptcy provisions in the, in the bankruptcy code because it makes no sense to me. So I, I only know of one even numbered one. So I want that that trivia to be passed on by you to others. I will do so. Uh, yeah, the only the only even numbered bankruptcy code section is Chapter 12. I'm not sure why uh, they picked Chapter 12 and not Chapter 10 because it goes from three, one to three, to five to seven to nine to 11 to 15, with a 13 sprinkled in there, it's not commonly used in my practice. So I, I do not know the answer to that question, Jason. I'll have to, I'll have to find out, which means you have to invite me back to, uh, to speak to this wonderful group. Certainly would love to have you back, Mark. Thank you everyone for joining us. Happy holidays. Uh, please join us again for the continuation of our uh, environmental essentials webinar series which will resume the second tuesday in january and uh, for those of you applying for new york cle credit you should see in the 20th minute of this presentation a code come up on your screen which you'll need for your application thanks again mark for, uh, for the informative uh, presentation and uh, we'll talk to everyone in the new year bye-bye